Continuing on our series, looking at the lab data behind endurance performance. Today, we are all about lactate threshold, how I go about identifying lactate threshold and breaking down really the four key methods that have been used over a long period of time to identify where someone's threshold is. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who has subscribed and help us get to two and a half thousand subscribers. Absolutely unbelievable. But let's not stop there. Let's keep growing this great community by hitting that subscribe button down below. Keep up to date with all the latest content coming here on the channel. Some more great videos in this series, but also some more great videos coming over the next little while. So keep an eye out for those and head over to Instagram. We're very, very close to a thousand followers on Instagram. So at NJ underscore sports science, that's our next goal. Try to get there before the end of the year. Head over, give it a follow. There's some different content on there other than the stuff that you see here on YouTube. So go check it out. Also, it's an easy way to get directly in touch with any questions or topic ideas you have that you want to see here on the channel. In regards to today's video, all about lactate threshold. We're talking about how do we identify off the lab data where someone's lactate threshold is and talking through the four main methods of identification. And really, there's a couple of things that I want to go through today in terms of some of the more old school methods, which are some of the ones I'll touch on firstly. Then I'll take you through into the data, the method that I use, which is more the individualized method, which I'll get to at number three. And then also a backup method. Um, when we have some interesting blood lactate data, lab data is not always perfect. So how do we actually understand and have a look at where is someone's threshold? If some of our data is a bit all over the place from blood lactate alone, what are some other ways we can get the same insights from some different variables? And I've touched on this a little bit before, and it really does come down to things like VT2, and I'll get to that in a moment. So the first method that we really need to talk about is a bit of an old school one, but it's what we call, or what we know as OBLA, or onset of blood lactate accumulation, which is this idea or thinking that everyone's lactate threshold that theoretical 45, an hour, 45 to an hour intensity, or someone could hold for that period, is fixed at four millimoles of blood lactate. Now this is very, very old school. It's not something that's really recommended or used much anymore, very rarely. And when I do see it used, I get a little bit frustrated because we know that athletes are all very, very different based on their training history, the type of sessions that they do, what they're training for currently. It's all gonna differ. Some athletes I've seen in the lab at three millimoles. I've seen some athletes as high as six, six and a half millimoles is where their threshold is because they just have these steady increases, a bit more tolerance of anaerobic on that end extraordinarily aerobic on the other end of the spectrum with the low blood lactate. So a fixed point at four millimoles doesn't really work practically. And it is, like I said, it's something that was used in the past that was good enough. But now we know a bit more about physiology modern day. It doesn't really stack itself up. So onset of blood lactate accumulation, not a great method, but it still, it still is used a little bit and there is some merit to it. And if you get a bit lucky and you have a, an athlete who sits at four millimoles as their threshold, which does happen quite a lot and it, it, it happens quite regularly, then it can be a good point, but uh, I typically don't use it. Uh, it is more of that sort of old school method. Moving into sort of number two though, maximal lactate steady state. This one does have a little bit more, more bearing to it or MLSS is what we call it. And this effectively is the highest running speed or the highest uh, cycling power where lactate concentration is stable between 10 to 30 minutes in length. So we actually see on the graphs when you're plotting it and having a look at, well, what is my blood lactate accumulation doing? It slowly comes up and up and up and then it just flattens out and over that 10 to 30 minute uh, steady state effort, we see blood lactate accumulation doesn't do anything or blood lactate just doesn't increase or decrease. It just stays exactly the same. In which case at that point, we can get a pretty good idea. And that really the last, the highest intensity at which that occurs should be our threshold because beyond, beyond that intensity, we're going to see it, it rise quite rapidly and continue to rise. Whereas at threshold over that 10 to 30 minute period, you should in theory, see it stay exactly the same. The only issue with this method is it's extraordinarily time consuming. I know a lot of athletes like to do their 20 minute time trial uh, for cycling to get their FTP. You might even want to do a one hour effort. You know how time consuming that process is. Yes, it is going to give us some reasonable insight. And if you are measuring blood lactate, you can get a maximal lactate steady state, which is probably when I say the most ideal method, because we are talking about an intensity that's 45 to an hour in length. Doing a long time trial type effort where we can see it is going to be useful. But the downside is you need to do it at a particular intensity. You get through the end of the test have you pushed hard enough or have you not pushed hard enough is the guessing game you have to play at the beginning. So I guess that's the negative to it is that we get some interesting insights when you do push hard enough, but how do we know what is the correct intensity? And if we already identify that prior and go, all right, we think the intensity is 210 watts or 270 watts at threshold, let's do that. And then we actually find out it's true. Well, we already knew that information from the beginning. So why do we go through and waste training session after training session doing 30, 40, 50 minute efforts 
when we could have just gone out and spent the time in a more usable way. So I like that one from understanding is blood lactate actually accumulating once we've steady stated for a long period can be kind of useful. Maybe it's something you look at every now and then once you already have identified threshold as a confirming factor, but it's something that I'm not really, uh, it's not something that's practical in the lab. And when I look at athletes and time consuming um, tests, I would rather get the more bang for buck metric where I can minimal amount of time invested to get the maximum amount out of the athlete and most information is the best way forward because we're not taking any time out of training. And that's really where the individualized method number three comes in, where we're now using um, a series of incremental intensities. So we gradually increase and increase and increase the intensity up and up and up. We take blood lactate at each of those, allowing us to then identify where is a, where is a lactate threshold. And that's where I'm going to jump over to my little screen share of the data again. And this is the lactate graph that we produce in the lab. So if you remember from other videos in this series, every three minutes in this ramp test we've been using on my old uh, VO2 max data from last year, every three minutes we increase the intensity by 30 watts on the bike here. And on the run, we increase by 1K an hour. So you could argue that maybe we need a little bit longer longer period in each to get a genuine steady state. But we get pretty close when we've done some testing between three minute efforts versus four minute efforts. There's not much difference. The main thing with three minute efforts is it allows it to get a reasonable VO2 max reading as well, which is important for point number four, which I'm going to get, or the fourth method, which I'll get to in a moment. But this this representation here, this is not the actual data. I'm going to show you it in a, in a moment, the actual data from my test. This here is what an ideal graph would look like. If I was putting this in a textbook, this is what I would want to use to explain exactly where lactate threshold is. And hopefully you can identify it with me along here as well. We have a series of blood lactate readings that are quite consistently increasing, but they're very small increases. Resting through to 120, 150 watts, 180 these small increases on the on the left-hand side here that I've highlighted, 2 to 2.9, 3.1, 4.2, pretty, pretty small. And you can actually see in this circumstance, I've used four millimoles just out of, just out of uh, I guess, coincidence. But when I change it a moment back to the actual data, you notice it's quite different. You can see here, it's like small increases we're not interested in. What we are interested in with the individual method is the last point before the exponential increase in blood lactate. And you can see that really happens here. Typically, it's a two or more two or more millimole increase. The device, a handheld device error is about one millimole. So we like to exceed that quite significantly to make sure we have a change. You can see here that it's just rapidly rising after that. We go from four to eight. So it doubles quite quickly in the space of three minutes. And then another three minutes, it goes up even more again. And what you can see on the graph here is that we've got, we've got it plotted out and it's nice and flat and consistent. This point here is our last point, that 4.2, and that skyrockets up from there. So we look at that exp where it starts to go from a gradual increase to an exponential increase, that last point. And what we actually call is lactate inflection point, the last point before blood lactate accumulation rapidly or exponentially exceeds the removal rate, we start to see it accumulate really fast is the exact same thing as our lactate uh, lactate threshold. So that's the way we identify it if we have perfect data like this. And I mentioned earlier in the video, we don't always get perfect data. And I'm actually gonna manipulate this back to what we had um, in the lab when I actually did my testing, you can see now this data is a little bit more interesting to look at. Um, what, what we can see is we have two, two, three, six. It doesn't come up as much. It's not that four to eight millimole increase. And then we've kind of got another two millimole increase here. So if I'm looking at just the lactate data, I go, well, the first time it does the increase is here, but it doesn't really increase massively here. And I get a two millimole jump between 210, 240. I also get a two millimole jump between 240 and 270. I know that 270 is my VO2 max, so that can't be it. Is it 210? Is it 180? Maybe 240? You're playing a bit of a guessing game. I've seen enough of these tests where I know it's probably going to be closer to 180, and I know within my own physiology it was closer to that rather than being up here at the time. But it's the type of thing that you need to go back and have a look at some other methods. So the, the other or the final method I'm going to be talking through um, today is what we call the ventilatory threshold method, or you would have heard the, the term VT1, VT2 um, uh, thrown around a little bit. And basically all this is, and I mentioned in a previous video, is that the disproportionate increase in ventilation for our oxygen consumption. Basically, the body is just trying to get in as much air as possible because more air means more oxygen supply, and that oxygen supply is going to combat the increase in metabolic byproduct accumulation. And what do I mean, what do I mean by metabolic byproducts? I mean lactic acid. I mean carbon dioxide is being produced. All of these things that are causing acidity in the body, we try to get oxygen back in to be able to combat that, to be in, the air intake is going to try and neutralize that increased acidity and keep our body as normal as possible. Also try to get as much aerobic energy being produced, less anaerobic energy to minimize the lactic acid accumulation, etc. So what does this look like in practice if we're trying to actually have a look at, look at the graph? And if I go to uh, 
if I go to wrong equation here, vent ventilation versus our VO2, we have this graph where it's kind of trickling up and then all of a sudden it spikes to the top. And if I bring up a little screenshot that I prepared earlier where, I, where I've actually sort of highlighted it, uh, this method for you, if I just move this out of the way, um, so you can see, what we've got here is we've got this graph and you can see on the black line, um, I've, actually, uh, I've actually got that linear progression through most of the test. So for the first three quarters of the test, ventilation is increasing at the same rate as oxygen consumption. For every liter of air or whatever it might be, however much air is coming into my system, I'm getting more and more oxygen consumption. As this test goes on though, and this highlighted point at that, that red circle you can see on the screen there, at that point, we now have a significant increase in ventilation, but oxygen consumption is increasing at the same rate. So we get this disproportionate change. And I really like to use what we call this vent equation graph. You can see at the bottom of my, um, my tab here, vent EQ is, uh, is what it's called. Um, I really like to use this graph because it's a really easy way to then second what I've seen in blood lactate. I'm seeing that, that change or that response to blood lactate accumulation, not necessarily just measuring it itself in the blood, but then having a look at, well, what is the, what is the body doing to combat that match these two points up and I can get a really clear picture. So in this circumstance, when I match these points up and I'll bring uh, my little screen off and I'll bring me back into the top corner here, when I match these up and have a look, that point is happening at the 14 and a half minute mark. So I can then go back into my averages tab, scroll down, scroll down here, 14 and a half minutes was happening towards the back end of 210 watts. Yep. So my heart rate at that point was 163 beats per minute. There's my threshold heart rate. There's my threshold power. Where does that match up to? And in my circumstance here, it's matching up to that 6.2. So when I was saying before, it could be 180, it could be 210. It's the type of thing that I would probably argue if I went out and did a 45 minute time trial, I would probably just hang it on at this point in time in my physiology, just hang it on to 210 for that 45 minutes, be pretty exhausted at the end because I've got 6.2 millimoles coming in, fair amount of blood lactate. If I was at 180, I'd be definitely under punching. I'd be able to hold that for well over, well, probably an hour, 10, hour 20, potentially even more. So that's where you, you really need that secondary measure to be able to identify what is it this point here at 180 or is it 210 where I've seen these two millimole or just more than two millimole increases, but it's happening multiple times. Which one actually is it? And that obviously has a big implication on, on what, our, what our training zones are. And as I said, in terms of heart rate and things like that as well along the way, obviously makes a bit of an interesting one. Um, you can see here, uh, I've actually got 163 as the average in that 30 second block. 171 was what it spiked at right at the end of that stage um, as a one second average when we're writing these ones down in this heart rate graph here. Um, we're looking at, at the exact time the intensity ticks over, what was the last heart rate we saw. So I was seeing a bit of drift towards the end, obviously six millimoles of blood lactate coming up a bit. Um, and we mentioned before 14 and a half minutes is just before the end of the stage. So there's a few methods to identify lactate threshold. I've just been through four, like I said, OBLA or onset of blood lactate accumulation and maximal lactate CD state. MLSS is actually a good method, but it's just not practical at all. OBLA's outdated, four millimoles, doesn't clearly uh, show anything because my blood lactate um, at lactate threshold is 6.2 millimoles or thereabouts. The individualized method using in different intensities as it gradually increases and, and taking blood lactate is arguably the best way to do it. Even better way to do it to make sure you can guarantee exactly where threshold is, is to have some of that ventil ventilation data in terms of oxygen consumption versus how much air you're getting in, that disproportionate increase. VT2 is actually what we're looking for there, not VT1. I'll come to that in a future video when we talk about getting that long, slow base, uh, base type zone, zone two, whatever you want to call it. VT1 comes in handy there. We actually have two, but the clear one that we see is that VT2 that matches up with our lactate threshold. And there's a few ways you can identify in the data. So hopefully you got some insight into how I go through and analyze some of the data, match up a couple of these variables, respiratory responses with my blood lactate. If you have any questions in the, uh, about any of the content we've covered, leave them down in the comments down below. Always happy to help and help you work through. Hopefully you're enjoying this series. And if you have been, but you haven't subscribed to the channel, please make sure you do hit the big red button down below. Hit subscribe, make sure notifications are turned on so you keep up to date when these videos go up. Some great response to this series so far, and I'm enjoying building out more of analyzing the data, taking you through it step by step. So hopefully you come along with that journey with me. Again, like I said at the beginning, we're being very close to a thousand followers on Instagram. Head over to at NJ underscore sports science in the bottom right corner. Some different content over there. Give me a follow, reach out, send a message, uh, ask you questions. Happy to talk to you uh, and engage with you guys in the community. That is it for today, guys. I'm going to leave it there. Looking forward to more videos in this series taking you through the lab data, and we'll see you in the next one.